Hey everyone, welcome to Project Spark Tutorials. Today's video is going to cover cinematography, pathing, and anything you need to make some cool cinematics. I've decided to use the level that I'm working on to show you exactly how to do this. So let's check it out. This may look intimidating at first, but once you get the hang of it, it'll be no problem. The one thing you can't avoid is the amount of time you'll have to put into doing something like this if you have a large scale project like I have. So for instance, this took me about two hours to put together and debug and test. Uh, that's just something you can't avoid, so it's always best to start out small. So to give a brief description of what I've done here, this logic cube turns into our camera and it follows this path right here. Well, it's looking at this red cube that follows an alternate path on this side. Let's get a better look at what's going on behind the scenes. I'll make this cube visible so you can see what's happening. So I've set up a small scenario here where our hero is going to run across a group of goblins around the corner. Alright, we're gonna start with a logic cube. We're gonna place it right in the path that the player's gonna walk. Now with this turned on, you can see the detect sensor. And we can adjust it with this little grabber right here to make it as big or as small as we want. Uh, we want it at least as wide as the cavern so that the player can't accidentally go around it. Alright, so we've set up a new variable called cinematic and we've made sure it's global so that every other object can see it as well in case we need to do something fancy later. Alright, now we've set up the cube to detect the player and when it does that to set the cinematic boolean variable that we created to true. So on the second page here you'll see camera. This is where we're going to spend most of our time. And you want to go to camera effects and I like to put in a letterbox just to make it a little more cinematic. You got some other cool options here like camera shake it says it shakes the camera at a specific intensity, so if you're doing earthquakes or if you have a really huge boss and you want to shake the camera a bit, that's a cool effect. And then depth of field is something that's it's pretty tricky. Um, you have to kind of play with it to, to get the right values. And with depth of field, you can change different modifiers. And you just have to kind of play with this. It takes quite a bit of time to actually look through and and get the effect that you want so this is one way to set this up I've created a boom camera and I've set it to look at this angle and then I've chosen the transition type ease between transition alright let's see what this looks like you can see what happened there we don't want it to clip through the mountain like that the other problem is we don't get our character back so let's figure this out I've adjusted the positioning of the cube but if you look at the outer circle here when the player enters this area right here that's when the camera will activate and it's going to ease from this position over so if I want it to transition without clipping through the mountain, I'm going to have to start from here. And then we just approximate where we want it. 
Something like that should work. Let's see what it looks like. That looked pretty good, but we have one or two more things we have to fix before it's ready to publish. So now we have it after a five second interval, the global cinematic variable will be set to false. And because we've changed this bit of code, this camera will only be able to trigger once. Pretty cool. Works well. Now the other thing you may have noticed was the health bar sticking out under the letterbox mode. Well, we can fix that really easily. So now letterbox mode serves as a second purpose to hide all of your graphical user interface. If you keep them under the letterbox as it pops up, you won't have to worry about it. If you have anything that you're gonna put in the middle of the screen like a big mini map or if you're gonna do a, a cursor for a first person shooter uh, plan ahead and use boolean variables to toggle those on and off so that's one way to do it let's take a look at the more complicated way that I've set up in my own level so let's take a look at the brains for this camera just like before we have a boolean variable and when the cube detects the player it starts the camera. As the camera turns on, we use the fade transition so that it doesn't jar the player. I'm using the first person camera instead of the boom camera because we want it from the perspective of the logic cube itself as it runs along the path. And I've set it to without controls. I don't want the player to accidentally run off the cliff and be put at an imposition and the transition type is ease between transitions so it's a little bit smoother. I've set the red cube to move along the path uh, and I've selected the second path here with the inworld picker and I want to make sure it's with flying because if you set your cubes to character or if you change some of the properties you want to make sure that they'll fly and this towel adjusts the speed that the box moves along the path. You see here there's a half second wait so after countdown timer half a second the logic cube which is the camera starts moving on the path. This is to give the primitive cube a little bit of a head start. You can also do this by starting the path for the primitive cube a little bit further but this was a way that I used to tweak the timing of the cameras. And then here we're in the brain of the logic cube, so I'm telling the logic cube to look at the primitive cube. Now here you see an ending sequence. When our camera's logic cube detects this logic cube, which is at the end of the path, you can set this to anything. You can have it detect an object nearby, you can have it detect the player or an enemy. Uh, anything will work. So when it detects that logic cube, it runs this sequence where it fades out again, and then this code basically turns the camera off, which gives the player control and resets his camera. Looking through the properties, there's a couple of things you want to pay attention to. If you're using fly, you can adjust the fly speed and acceleration. You gotta be careful when uh, changing the physics type, because if you set it to tumbling or character then you have to worry about how it moves as a character or how it tumbles. It's best to just leave this unfixed. If you have to use the pitch or yaw tiles, um, just be aware of the physics type. You may have to change it to character to get it to work. So in this scenario I have a windmill at the end of this path and I want to show the character what's up ahead to kind of guide them along. So in the prop section. Open up the menu and type in path. You'll see the pathing tool. And then you'll see these little markings here. They're like vectors. You can add more by clicking the plus. Um, it's a lot easier if you have a 360 controller because it seems to add them 
really far away for some reason. Alright, so I quickly went through and made a rough path here that follows where I want the player to go. Uh, but you'll see it's just from point to point. It's very rough. And we want to adjust that and make it a little smoother. Under properties, you want to click path. And then you'll see mover mode. Uh, there's all sorts of different types of ways that the path can be used. Ping pong goes from the start to the end and then all the way back. Loop CW, you see it adds an extra line from the first vector to the final node. This creates a loop so that it continues to go around in a circle. The position mover mode seems to be related to guiding an NPC towards a certain position, but I'm not exactly sure how it works yet. It seems similar to play once. And play once just goes from beginning to end. We want to use play once in this case. And instead of saying straight from one point to another, we want to change this to curve so it's nice and smooth. In Spark, when you click on an object, you'll see a picture-in-picture -picture mode pop up. This shows from its perspective. You'll see that the main hero has a third-person view, but then when we switch to this camera, it's going to show basically the mountain here. So we want to turn him around, and you'll see how this changes. All right. All right, we have our logic cube, which is going to house our camera, and we have the path that we want the camera to run. Now, if we wanted to, just like my other level, we could create a second path and run an additional item that's invisible along that path. Then you just set this Logic Cube's camera to look at that item, but for this we're just going to keep it simple. All I'm going to do is set the camera to look at the lighthouse. So I've set up a basic camera. I use letterbox like I did before. I have the first person camera without controls, transition type ease between transition, and I have a 10 second timer. The only thing that's left is I have to have the cube move along the path here. So let's do that now. So now the cube will move along the path that I've selected with flying one and a half times the normal speed. And we also want it to look at the object as well. All right, let's see how it works. All right, it's pretty rough. But you can see how uh, changing the camera's speed and adjusting those vectors along the path will have a big impact on how it looks. If you've ever played a video game with a long cutscene and the developer doesn't put it in a way to skip it, it gets pretty annoying. So if you take a look at this, I've set it so when the player presses the B button, it will end the cinematic sequence. So what else can we do with pathing? It's a great way to script different NPC characters so you can make your world a little more lived in. But it's also great for enemies so you can create artificial intelligence so they don't just stand there. So I'm going to put a few goblins here and I'm going to have them walk around a path in the way of the character. If you take a look at the ball that's running along the path, that'll show you exactly where the character or object will move. If the character has physics, or if it bumps into another object, then it will have to correct for that. So we have a simple path that wraps around here, but now we're going to have them move along the path with some simple code. I removed the goblin's brain because things can get complicated when it's trying to detect the player, just to make it a little easier to understand. Something really important to keep in mind is, within the pathing properties, you want to make sure that orientation is set to 3D. If this is set to fixed, then any object that's following it will face one direction and walk around the circle facing that same direction. Make sure that's set to 3D and it looks like this. You can 
can see now he's accurately following the path. There's some other neat things you can do, like pausing at points, so it makes him patrol and then stop. The pause at end feature only works on ping pong, where it actually has an end to stop at, so it won't work for modes like loop. Alright, so that should give you guys a start on how to create your own cinematics and how to use pathing. So if you have any questions or ideas for future tutorials, let me know in the comments. As always, thanks for watching.